the contract to write SWE, nobody knew how, what it, an impact it would have, what a bestseller it would be. Everybody read it. And in fact, uh, from what I heard, it was, it was hard to get enough copies, so people would tear it in half, and some people would read the second half, and some people would read the first half. He was born in Warsaw on May 16, 1920. He came from an absolutely middle-class, very assimilated Jewish family. He was an only child. His father was in the, I think, wholesale leather business, and his mother was considered one of the great beauties of Warsaw. German planes dive low over the city as they attack. Incendiary bombs took comparatively few lives, but they left hundreds of thousands homeless. In their wake remained only the smoking embers. These are the faces of a nation besieged. These helpless civilians were the real victims and the unhappy heroes of the War of Sea. Both his parents were in Majdanek, and the father didn't make it but uh, I think she used her staggeringly good looks and probably uh, was able to convince people to rescue her. He uh, refused to go to the ghetto, His, and he decided to escape to Lithuania, where he was for a while. And then he decided, as he always used to tell me, to hide in the eye of the storm, which was Germany. So he went to Frankfurt, and he became a waiter in a prestigious hotel. Then he tried to escape to uh, neutral Switzerland, but he was apprehended and sent to a concentration camp in Norway, a very famous concentration camp called Greeny. After the end of the war, he stayed there for a while as a, uh, I think he was a member of the uh, Red Cross in Norway. And then he returned to Poland and he became a journalist. It was instant hatred at the beginning. He hated the Nazi regime and then he came back to Poland and saw another murderous totalitarian regime. Not only interested in, in murdering off bodies, but was interested in taking over minds. Everything in communism was so gray and they, I think he felt that it was controlling him. And that was, that was, a, that was his form of rebellion. He was, very, he was very much a dandy, very much into clothes. There was nothing much available in post-war uh, communist Poland. So he used to go to the, uh, the used clothing markets and pick up clothes, and he had a wonderful tailor who would uh, tailor the clothes to fit him. And uh, the Red Sox were part of this dandyism. He always said jazz was the, the uh, movement of freedom, that jazz represented everything that communism was not. He, he was basically the one that introduced jazz to uh, Poland. And uh, he started a Polish jazz festival It was very hard for him to get published, and finally he wrote a book uh, which is trans not translated to English, but the title it would be High Society and Sentimental Life or Emotional Life. And because they didn't allow it to be printed, he decided to leave. He would be a doorman uh, to support himself and, and just write in Polish. 
He never thought that he would be uh, published in The New Yorker, for example. Well, at first, he was a big success in The New Yorker, and they even printed up a pamphlet of uh, one of his articles and distributed it. But then Leopold became increasingly disillusioned with the mindset of New York at the time. And they parted ways. He would write a piece for commentary, he would write a, a piece for the New Reporter, but it was a real struggle. I did not know him on a sort of intellectual basis in person. Uh, I really got to know him better through his writing. Uh, I have a few isolated memories uh, of him before he died when my sister and I were four. And one of the, uh, the memories that stands out is the level of importance uh, that he felt regarding the evening news. And certainly there was change of foot. Uh, obviously John Paul II and Solidarity had started to drive the debate about communism and Poland's place behind the Iron Curtain. So I remember him yelling at us uh, a few times about how important this was and to basically scram. Uh, so the first one that I read, the first full-length book, was this one, uh, Notebooks of a Dilettante, which was his de Tocqueville-style travelogue. Uh, when he came to the U.S. the first time on a lecture tour sponsored by the State Department in the 60s. Uh, and he wrote with a critical eye coming from communism about Western culture, the freedoms, the excesses, certainly being in the throes of the countercultural revolution uh, in, the, in the mid to late 60s. I came away very, very impressed with his, uh, with his craftsmanship as a writer, his wordsmithing, uh, his adept skill at the English language, because here he was a Polish emigre, uh, who, much like Conrad, uh, was proud of the fact that he'd written a lot of the things he was most, uh, uh, most proud of in the English language. The one book that I think is the most important and the most universal and should be a, uh, a part of the well-educated reader's reading list is The Diary, because The Diary is somewhat unique uh, for the communist, uh, the communist experience. Uh, there are some great, there's great literature about communism, Solzhenitsyn, Milos, uh, Herbert, uh, many Poles, others, Czech, Russians, uh, who do talk about it. But the diary is a little different because it really uh, breaks down the everyday indignities uh, of life under the communist system, especially for a free thinker. Uh, so a lot of the other narratives uh, and di diaries, first-hand accounts, are as a dissident, uh, a experience that most people in the communism did not experience uh, firsthand. Uh, they would, they, they saw it, it was close to their experience, but it wasn't their inner monologue. But it really shows the darkness, the coldness, the drabness, the unfeelingness of the society and the everyday indignity that that creates in just a man trying to make his way in Warsaw in the 50s. <laughs>